courses. Okay, good morning everyone. We reached the last day of uh, Rule ML. And we start with the first talk by Emiliano Cervesato. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me here? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, thank you very much. So, this is, uh, I'm going to talk about some joint work that I've done with uh, Elliot Gazzara, who is here, and uh, Edmund Lam. And it's about, uh, uh, it's going to be a little bit more technical than, than talks that I've seen yesterday. So, um, bear with me or enjoy it, depending on your point of view. Um, so, what I'm going to do is to go through uh, some context about where this work comes from. And then I'm going to go into the meat of it. So the context is about how do we as a community implement uh, concurrent and distributed applications. The traditional way and traditional meaning that is what pretty much everybody does to this day with a few exceptions is the following. You have some great idea that you want to implement, for example, on a system of mobile phones or servers or whatever, that are distributed. And uh, you hire a programmer that has done that before, that is going to write some code for every, um, every, pro every role, every aspect, every device in a way, or every, every class of devices. So for example, your system may consist of consumers, which is very typical. So your programmer or your team is going to write some code for the consumer. Your system will also contain a producer, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Then there will be a dual program, typically, or like some more code, that implements this uh, producer role that is probably going to get loaded on other devices, maybe on the same. And there may be other roles in your system that are neither producer or consumers, but others. So you end up in this kind of simple scenario here with three different programs that somehow need to work together. Once you have that, you compile it, and this is where it becomes interesting. Because at this point, the first time you do it never works. There are always bugs. And you have to go back and tweak all these programs so that eventually they achieve what you really wanted to do. So this way of developing thing is what we call a node-centric. That means that you are writing code for each individual node while vaguely keeping in mind how they should talk to every, every other node. And you are writing the code that lets all these nodes communicate. Okay? This is the state of the art pretty much. So uh, what Another way to do it, and we are not the first to do that, but we are the first one maybe to do it at this kind of, of scale, is to write a single program that describes how your various nodes are going to interact. So rather than taking the point of view of individual nodes, we are taking the point of view of the system. We have a bird's eye view of all the, the synchronization communication that is happening. Uh, we are particularly interested in developing code for mobile devices. So that means that if you do that, there is a whole lot of local computation that happens to um, draw your screen, uh, handle user interactions, and so on. So that means that besides this system-centric specification that describe how the system, uh, how, who talks to what, what, who expect messages from whom, there is also an aspect of local computation, let's say, that in which you implement uh, draw a line here on your device and so on. Okay? We do that. Once this is done, then we press a button. No, this is what I just said. We press another button, and this gets automatically compiled into the code that is going to be running on this device or class of, class of devices. Okay? This was done is done manually typically. The moment we do that, we have guaranteed we are guaranteeing that the devices are going to communicate in a way that is sensible. If we get this right, this is going to be right. Okay? Uh, and at this point, what we obtain some form of node-centric code, but I'll, I'll show you a little bit what it looks like in our case. 
and then we can just compile to standard executable code. Okay. Um, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is one aspect of this process here, of these arrows here, going from this to this. Um, and I'd like to say that, let's see, I think I have, yeah, I'll, I'll say that in a minute. Uh, this makes development a lot faster and introduces a lot fewer errors. Huh? And Ali here is a witness of this, huh? or like um, not a witness, a poster child of this. Huh? Ali was a, an undergrad student. It took him like, you know, a little bit of time to understand the language, like when you learn every language. But now, he cranks up an application in less than a week. <laughs> okay, so um, this, is, this was fairly general. What I'm going to be focusing on is the, the language that we, are go that we have um, uh, been working on that is called uh, Comingol. So Comingol is a rule-based language, which is fitting for this conference, huh? that describe um, how nodes work together. And I'm going to give you a very tiny example in just a minute. Okay? It targets uh, Android devices. So we have it working on Android phones and a few other, other things. But it's uh, currently our um, case, our proof of concepts was targeting Android. Okay? Uh, and uh, we've written a dozen, a few, maybe more applications at kind of various levels that do that. So let me show, you, let me tell you about one really simple application that was one of the first ones that we wrote. So uh, this is a game that is inspired by something that was done at Google uh, called Chrome Racer a few years ago, and. What happens is that you have a number of users, you am showing three, huh? and by tapping on their phone, they have little cars that are racing across the screen. Okay? And uh, as a game, it's not particularly entertaining, although my students find it very entertaining, maybe more than my lectures, but that's a different story. Okay? Uh, but it involves quite a bit of coordination, of synchronization of uh, actions that to do that. So the whole Comingle program that does this is, consists of these five rules. I'm going to tell you a bit more about these rules. There is code that draws the screen that responds to you tapping and so on, but is separate. It's, it's something that you'd have to do anyway. Okay? But that code is purely local, does not handle any kind of communication with any other device. This is how you specify the application. And I'm going to um, show you, a f like, say a few more things about some of these. I'm not going to go in, in details. So you c you, we have, a, we have a, one of our papers talk about this in detail. Okay. So each of these are rules with a left hand side and a right hand side. And as typical, if the left hand side is satisfied, the right hand side um, does something. Okay. Um, if you notice. Each of these things in a rule here, these are, we call them facts, are prefixed by something in bracket. So this denotes location. And these locations are parametric. So I'm going to be talking about this rule next year. So this rule says that if, if a fact exists y is present at x, and x and y are parametric here, and some more stuff is around, then we write them into this. Okay. Um, so these are localized rules that, as you can notice, let me just move to this. A rule like this talks about facts happening that happen to be at a bunch of different locations. Actually, they don't even have to be different, right? So, for example, this particular rule here describes what needs to happen when one player's car crosses the boundary between one device and the other. So keep in mind that these devices are connected through just Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or something, okay? And they, one may be here, the other one may be there, and still you want to have like a seamless interaction, right? So let me read this rule for you. It says, if the underlying system tells you that um, 
y's car is about to exit from x, okay, and if the next form next to x is z, okay, then remove the fact that x is at y, replace it with the fact that x is at z, and this just instructs z is to display the right the right thing. If you look at this rule, it involves computation that is happening at a multitude of nodes, right? It is very natural for us to think about it because we see everything that is happening. Think about what it means to implement this from the point of view of this one. This is what coming goals and single languages give you as a power. Okay? So, now, let me say a little bit more what we uh, are doing in the paper that is in proceedings here, okay? So, this is the same rule that I had uh, uh, mentioned, uh, that I've talked about just now. Um, this, of course, if you have something like that, you need to turn this that makes sense from the point of view of us people, programmers, into something that can be executed on actual nodes, right? So. We want to go from this system-centric rule that talks about different nodes doing various things into a node-centric node uh, rule, into a node-centric code that is going to take the point of view of each individual node. Huh? Okay, and in our case, this code is going to be rewrite rules in a similar formalism. Okay, this transformation we call it choreographic um, transformation. That's not our term, but that was, it has been around for a while. Uh, and once we have that, we transform the, the resulting local rules, I'm going to show you something in a minute, into executable, executable code. Okay? Uh, yeah, so we did that early later if you're interested, or we can give you a demonstration that shows how that works, okay? Um, okay, so now the kind of novel, one thing that is, uh, that we have in coming goal, or that we have introduced fairly recently, is the idea of multi-step comprehension. I'm going to mention that to describe what it does in a little bit. Our original compilation schemes did not handle multi-step comprehension because, as you will see, they introduced some kind of new, new aspects. And this paper in the proceedings deals with that. Okay, so let's go into it. Uh, yes, I just said that. So let me say a little bit about multi-step comprehension. So this is an, a different rule. It does uh, what this is meant to do. What it does is for a node that may be, for example, in a, in, in a physical room, to collect temperature data from all of its neighbors that could be sensors in the room or in the building, and compute their average and send them to another node. All that is done by this one single rule, okay? So let me go through a little bit of the things that, may be less uh, that you may be less familiar with. And that has to do with these things, with those funky brackets here. These are multi-set comprehensions. What this thing does is, is going to collect all the facts neighbor, neighbor n that reside at node X. We're <coughs> going to put all those N's into this variable NS, that is a multiset, a term level multiset. So all this, notice, happens at X. It's fairly easy for a node to collect all the data that it, it's holding. The next one is a little bit more interesting. It says, for every n in ns that you have collected just now, get the value t in there at that node n, at that node n, collect all those values into this new multiset ts. Again, that's a term level multiset. Okay. Once we have that, then we just compute the average, and uh, we just send it to some, we, we send this average a to some other node that we were asked to, to interact with. Okay? Sounds good? So this one was what we call a local comprehension happening at a single node. 
this is um, distributed our system century compressed. So we need to collect data from everybody else or for a lot of other nodes. But who's, how many is unspecified? A couple of things that, well, one thing especially that I'd like to mention. A rule like this is uh, uh, executed atomically from the point of view of the programmer. This is going to, uh, all rules are atomic, but in particular this one. That means that from the point of view of the programmer, all of these that I described as spent the last two minutes talking about happens in one go. And a key feature of compression is that they grab all facts matching a certain, uh, a certain code. All facts. Okay? Very good. So, comprehensions involve a few challenges that I'm going to describe next. Okay? So, this is a typical rule, and it's easier if I just show you this. I have some node X that is holding certain facts that I'm summarizing with HX. It needs facts from other nodes, F1 to Fn. Okay, these are the edges. Okay. Uh, this thing here is a guard that allows to filter out some, some values. Okay. And once it has collected all these facts, then it's going to rewrite some of those facts in X and uh, Fi's, and possibly send new facts to other, um, to other nodes. So this is described by these two parts here. This is the matching part, like what happens on the left-hand side. We have X that needs to collect facts from those various Fi's. Once it has collected those facts, these are going to be used to instantiate the right-hand side here, and this picture kicks in. Some things that happen here are going to be uh, updated or written or created in here. And then these new nodes um, um, are sent new, new information. Okay? Uh, so that means that the process is divided into two parts. We have a matching phase where we collect information on the left hand side and uh, a writing phase that we propagate the changes, we implement the changes. Press the wrong button, sorry. Okay. Uh, I think I'm back. Okay. So, um, Okay, so uh, let me say a little bit more about choreographic compilations in the absence of comprehensions. This is a rule, I'm going to say a bit more about something, a similar rule that allows two nodes, X and Y, to swap values up to um, a, a threshold that here is called P. Okay. This is also a system-centric node that um, manage, manages synchronization about, about, um, among two different nodes in this case. And it, get, it gets compiled into a number of other rules, each of which, the left-hand side, uh, deals with facts that happen at a single node. So this is what we mean by, by uh, node-centric rules. Okay? So every system-centric rule gets compiled into a number of system-centric rules that implement the same thing. And in the absence of comprehension, it's fairly, it's fairly simple, right? Even, I'm, I'm not going into the details here, okay? Uh, comprehension patterns complicate things for uh, one simple fact. So I mentioned that a comprehension pattern on the left-hand side of a rule needs to grab all values that match uh, a certain pattern. Right, the pattern that they describe. Well, this all uh, complicates things quite a bit. Okay? 
traditional multiset writing is monotonic. If there are more facts in your in uh, in uh, in your state, then that doesn't prevent a rule from executing. Comprehension patterns, because of this little word "all," are non-monotonic. That means that if I'm able to make a transition using some rule from a program state st to st prime, adding new facts may prevent me from maintaining the same formula. That has huge impacts at the level of, in, of implementation and consequently of compilation. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate, to say something about compiling um, commingle rules with multiset comprehension on the basis of the example that is here. Let me say what it does first. So we have two nodes. That's kind of a variant of what I showed you earlier. X and Y. X wants to swap some data value for the predicate data up to a threshold P. Okay, so these are just facts that describe what they have, they, they, that enable them to do it. And these two comprehensions here, this one grabs all the values n from data n that are less than p, less than or equal to p, put them in some multiset ns. Same thing happens for m, but for values greater than or equal to p. And here, those, the contents of ms and ns are dumped in the, opposite, in the, in the other node. So it's just like a swap. Okay. Uh, okay. So I mentioned two things. A rule like this needs to be executed atomically, and max, um, comprehensions are maximal. So we grab all facts that match a certain pattern. So let's see how that, that's done. So I'm going to do it by example. So this is a rule that we have just done, and it gets compiled into the following five rules. Let me go through each of them and comment what is going on here. So the first row here happens at node X. So the left hand side is executed by node X. Okay. It does all the things that happened at node X up there. So the swap YP and then this local comprehension X data N. And plus a few more. I need to lock the x, in this case, x and later y, so that no other rules can execute at the same time, and that's to prevent, that's to enforce the maximality of comprehensions. And I need to somehow compute, uh, like set up the transaction. This is done by means of this next. Okay? So next is some count, uh, and here the argument of next is some count. Okay? So I grab all this stuff, and then this gets rewritten to the following. So let's do the easy things first. I replace next n with next x, n plus 1 at x. Uh, e is some, some kind of global transaction counter that is computed on the basis of n and the name of a, of a node x. Okay. And then I set up things so that I can carry out the content of the rule. So I send a request to X to essentially do its part of the bargain. Okay. And I set up a stage here. Um, I set up a fact here at X that tells me, okay, now you have to wait for values from X before you can proceed and then you can continue. Okay. So the next rule says what happens at Y. One, this has been done by X. Okay, Y has an okay, fact, okay swap fact. It can collect all of its values of data. It does receive a request coming from X. Okay, and it also needs to lock some facts. Okay, so this is this predicate. Once it has done that, well, it um, declares that it participates in the transaction and it sends the answer that why that X was expected. Okay, so this is in a somewhat optimistic uh, setup where uh, things are going to work. I'm going to tell you later what if things do not work out. What if X, uh, Y cannot 
uh, or doesn't want to execute this, uh, participate in this transaction. So this is still like the success uh, scenario. Okay. So the next thing here, we go back to X. X was waiting for some data from Y. It got an answer from Y. Then what it does is that it executes the left hand side, the right hand side of the rule. It releases all the logs. Okay. And it puts those done facts here that the next rule here is going to use to clean up all the transaction facts. Okay? This is a successful execution. An execution can be unsuccessful for a couple of reasons. One, because, for example, for Y to participate in this rule, it needs to have this OK swap fact. It may not have it. X didn't know when it started the transaction. Uh, or also because it could be, so in, in more complicated settings than that, it may not have the, nece uh, nece the necessary information. So we model it by this rule here, that at this, in the paper it's done, we give the opportunity to uh, Y to uh, abort non-deterministically, huh? okay, to model these various scenarios. And we also have a system here by which we can ensure that there are not going to be any, any kind of deadlocks in the system. So I'm not going to talk too much about, about this. This is fairly, fairly standard. Okay? So what we need to add to, um, to the facts that are present in the system are these three types of facts that, are, uh, that were color-coded uh, earlier. Locking facts allowed to lock uh, some, some facts. Okay? These transaction facts manage um, transaction counters, um, and they allow to know, uh, since we're like breaking a rule execution into various stages, they allow to make sure that trans um, like we, we know in which transaction we are participating in, and also that we have a way to avoid that. Okay? Uh, staging facts, record, record com um, values along the various stages of one thing that I'd like to point out, if we don't have confirmation patterns, we need this tool, but we don't need to lock anything. The locking facts serve a purpose of um, uh, incremental maximum. Okay? And here I showed you just an example. Uh, there is much more in the paper, and I'm not going to go through that, but it becomes technical pretty quickly. Okay, so um, some results. Well, these two are kind of neat. Once we compile programs, the compiled program carries out all the behaviors that were inherent in the original program and does not introduce any new ones. This is the gist of the soundness and complete results that I'm showing you. This progress result here, and uh, what it does is to, make, to ascertain that during compilation does not introduce new things like deadlocks. Okay? So if your original program did not have a deadlock, no new deadlock is going to be introduced by breaking those rules into little pieces and letting them be that. Okay, so we implemented this. If you are interested in playing with it, you can go to GitHub at this address, retrieve the whole system, load it on your phone, should work. Phones, it's, it's a lot more fun when there is more than one. Okay, uh, and, uh, and play. Okay, um, and we can give you some demos of Comingo a little bit later, as I mentioned. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be uh, ending uh, more or less here. So as a summary, uh, I described a general framework of an, a general paradigm for implementing um, distributed and concurrent applications that is based on automatically rewriting system-centric code into node-centric code. We have carried out this work in Common Goal, that is a declarative rule-based language for um, currently Android applications, okay? Um, 
and we've been quite successful using it. Okay. So what I've what I've said, uh, I should mention that what I've said applies to a very broad class of rule-based languages. In particular, since most rule-based languages don't have those complications like uh, multi-set comprehensions. Uh, okay, so I'm going to stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, on slide 50, uh, when you were doing a board, I, didn't, I noticed that you don't free the uh, memory that was uh, allocated by X. Let me check. 50? Uh, for 48, 48. So you usually um, abort when uh, uh, Y is not okay to swap. so much in a slide. Yeah. All right. yeah. The second question, did you try to implement Paxos, uh, this distributed payment algorithm, Paxos algorithm? Okay, what does it do? Uh, it's for message passing between uh, distributed uh, computers, but uh, probably doesn't apply in this case. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that. Thank you for the feedback. was not really the focus of this. So we, we could incorporate this uh, here, but probably the US will not want that. Oh, that's actually, uh, sorry, Ed. We actually incorporated that, but uh, we incorporated it at the engine level uh, of, of the project, right? So you have a sort of communication engine that has and handles all message passing. Uh, it was implemented as a delay tolerant network. So if, if a device does drop out of the network, which does happen, It'll carry forward all messages uh, that were intended to be sent, including facts that were, were to be transmitted, and so on and so forth. And then when it rejoins the group, it checks back with all the devices and whether uh, this fact was locked, and so on and so forth. Could it just say carry messages forward to where? Uh, so let's say device A wanted to send a message to device C, but he had no direct connection, and his only way was through device B. Uh, but device B dropped out of the network for some reason. Device B will carry A's messages until he gets into contact with C and then he'll pass it on. Okay. Right. Yeah, and this was the second part of uh, my answer, but contradicts the first part. We don't have it here on this slide, but we have implemented something and I can So um, the engine is basically um, Okay, so when you give us, when, when the engine is handed, uh, when the compiler is handed um, the commingle code, it translates that into Java code, uh, which is node-centric, so you went from system-centric to node-centric, and then what happens is you have a sort of a loop that loops through technically all the rules and sees which one can be consumed to, to do something. Uh, and what happens is when all the facts are present, 
it, it does all, it handles all the communication at a different layer, uh, a sort of a middleware of, or network, which does all the message passing. Does that sort of explain it? No. Okay. <laughs> so it's like a DMD process with completely different Correct. Right. Right. Exactly. Thank you very much.